Okay, good morning everybody. This is the first, uh, can I say, the, the first science at 10 uh, event and it's, we are experimenting so I'm very pleased to have William here and then you can see there's a big crowd turning out so that's, he's really a superstar so I think he's very pleased. So this one is about science, uh, it's short, snappy to the point and uh, I'm, I'm really pleased that there are so many of you turning because it's, William is going to present us a very interesting study that has been uh, developed in an occasional paper recently published uh, by C4 on uh, the study of 23 subnational initiatives uh, under the Red Plus mechanism. And it will tell us everything we need to know about this and where does it bring us in terms of uh, achievement in terms of greenhouse gases and climate change. Having said that, William, please. Okay, thank you, Robert. It's an honor to be uh, at this inaugural event. And it's nice to see, to see such a big turnout. Um, I want to present to you the results of this study that was begun in mid-2012 and it was launched yesterday as a C4 occasional paper. And the title, I guess, is up there, uh, The Challenge of Establishing Red on the Ground insights from 23 subnational initiatives in six countries. There are 12 co-authors other than myself. Four of those are C4 people, um, Andini De Sita, Aaron Sills, Amy Duchel, uh, Demetrius Cueca, and the other eight co-authors are representatives of red proponent organizations that we have been collaborating with in the last five years. Before I get into the substance of the, fi of the findings, uh, let me give you a bit of background. In 2007, after decades of failure in various approaches to stopping deforestation and forest degradation, there was much excitement about RED. Implicitly, it held a lot of promise. As the Norwegian Prime Minister at the time said, everybody knows how not to cut down trees. The key to the approach was to give conditional performance-based rewards to stakeholders entrusted with protecting and enhancing and restoring forests. Different from past efforts, a very substantial amount of funding would be mobilized, first through bilateral and multilateral aid, and eventually uh, through the marketing of verified forest carbon credits. In, since 2009, Module 2 of the Global Comparative Study um, on RED has been doing research at 23 initiatives in six countries, those being Brazil, Peru, Cameroon, Tanzania, Indonesia, and Vietnam. Our aim has been to collect two rounds of data at 170 villages and 4,600 households, half of them within the sphere of RED and half outside. The first round of data collection was done in uh, 2010 and 2011, before the presumed introduction of conditional red incentives, and the second round is being collected now. Our aim has been to measure the impact of these conditional incentives in red with regard to the three E's, effectiveness, efficiency, and equity, and the co-benefits, specifically as regards well-being, <coughs> rights, and biodiversity. Yet in 2012, in the midst of the research, we realized that five years after the onset of RED, it was barely moving ahead. A very small number of initiatives had begun to market forest carbon offsets, and informal communications with our proponent collaborators revealed that they were experiencing a wide range of difficulties. And it's in this context that we decided to conduct an in-depth survey of the challenges that they were facing. The approach of the survey was to interview representatives of all 23 organizations to assess their experience in protecting forests in the five following areas of inquiry. Number one, uh, background on forest pressures and the nature of interventions both before RED and during the period of RED. Two, measurement of the level of satisfaction of the proponents about what they were doing. Third, an in-depth assessment of the challenges experienced in setting up RED with answers quantified on a Likert scale. Fourth, discussion of the problems encountered and solutions attempted by proponents. And fifth, 
the proponent views on policy solutions at various uh, governance scales. And now to the results. The overarching result is this. There is serious grounds for concern about how and whether the red concept can persist and evolve based on the following four findings. Number one, conditional incentives might not be as central as it was once assumed it would be in red. 18 of the 23 proponent respondents have or will implement conditional incentives. However, only nine of them, when asked to identify the single uh, most important type of intervention for saving forests, only nine of them identified conditional incentives as key. Now this all could be explained uh, relatively easily. It's partly a function of, of timing with multiple factors uh, causing delay of effective implementation of conditional incentives. Relatedly, Many proponents have hesitated to talk with local stakeholders about conditional incentives for fear of raising expectations unnecessarily. Adding to the need for caution is that conditional incentives are experimental, so people want to uh, go carefully. And very importantly, some proponents have decided to move away from conditional incentives at the site level to individuals, but instead go up the scale of governance. The second finding is that there are indications that some initiatives are evolving away from red. When asked the percentage chance that in the year 2015 they would continue to function as red, 11 of the respondents said there was a 90 to 100 percent chance, 5 said it was a 50 to 70 percent chance, 3 said zero, but in fact, in all three of those situations, it's because they were transferring responsibility to another organization, and four already view themselves as not being read. The third main finding is that initiatives are operating as a hybrid of integrated conservation and development projects, or ICDPs, and red, and this has both advantages and disadvantages. At 15 of the 23 sites, forest protection activities began 10 or more years ago, meaning long before RED. Most of the sites involve implementation of ICDP in the sense of a combination of negative incentives, which is to say restrictions on, on uh, forest access and conversion, and a positive incentive, mainly in the form of non-conditional uh, livelihood rewards. The positive side of this approach is that it gives proponents an ability to move ahead while waiting for the, con the uh, conditions for red to fall in place. But the negative side of this is that inasmuch as ICDP is viewed to have failed in the 1980s and 1990s, then it's clearly a liability. The fourth finding has to do with the proponents' perceptions of the main challenges that they are facing. And we, I, we single out two, the, the top two in the list. The top one is tenure, uh, tenure and security. And tenure is a big problem for RED for the following reasons. RED is unfolding in a landscape where quite often um, land tenure is contested and therefore insecure. From the point of view of the proponent, there's an absolute I need to identify the legal right holder to the plan stream of benefits in red, as well as the bearer of responsibility for conditional outcomes. Other research that we've done has shown that external claims on local red forests are a major threat to future red stability. And proponents are faced with tenure problems not just locally, but nationally as exemplified by, by the effect of the agricultural lobby on the Brazil Forest Code and on the Indonesian Forest Moratorium. With the exception of Brazil, all proponents in our study have lim limited leverage trying to resolve within their boundaries pro tenure problems that are national in origin and in scope. The second problem is the disadvantageous economics of red. And this is a huge problem because in many cases, red simply cannot compete with alternative forest converting land uses, such as soy or livestock in Brazil or oil palm in Indonesia. In the language of economics, 
Red is simply <coughs> unable, in most cases, to pay the opportunity costs of forest land conversion. To pay the opportunity costs of forest land conversion, it is estimated will require anywhere from five to $12.5 billion, billion US dollars per year. Yet, until now, the total amount of, of public sector funding has been $6 billion, not per year, but across all the years to date. And the main reason for that, we assess, is the inability to date to forge a binding international climate change mitigation agreement necessary to create the regulatory environment that it would in turn serve to propel a robust forest carbon market. And in closing, let me turn to our recommendations that are at the international level and the national level. At the international level, consistent with what we found in our book, um, our last book on red, we argue for a turn away from the policies and interests that support deforestation and degradation, as well as those that support continued reliance on fossil fuels. We recommend acceleration of efforts towards achieving a global climate change agreement. At the national level, we suggest policies targeted at the, the tenure and security problem. Um, in regard to that, we recommend following the example of Brazil, which has a direct linkage between forest tenure reform and targeted environmental outcomes. We recommend following the example of Indonesia, where there's integration of national forest land use planning among ministries and sectors in their one map policy. We propose incorporation of partic participatory tenure mapping into national tenure institutions, resolution of contestation between statutory and customary claims, enforcement of existing rights of exclusion for local stakeholders, clar clarification of forest carbon tenure rights, and enabling, as in Brazil, collaboration between proponent organizations and government institution, institutions in resolving tenure issues. In addressing the disadvantageous economics of RED, we recommend decoupling agricultural growth from agricultural area expansion, uh, development of sustainable agricultural supply change, improved forest land use decision making through reduction of corruption and cronyism, and enforcement of laws against illegal logging, among other uh, legal reforms. Very lastly, our study points out that although the current circumstances are weighted heavily against success for RED, we need to bear in mind the following fact that might or might not be a basis for optimism. Overall, Brazil in the last nine years has had dramatic success in reducing its rate of deforestation in spite of the fact that enabling conditions for RED are not yet in place. And in fact, it has delivered the single biggest national contribution to uh, climate change mitigation around the world. I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you.